Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the webinar. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, I'm Randy Likas. Uh, I am the uh, head of sales uh, in North America for Nectar. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about uh, complex buying committees. How do we strategically engage uh, the stakeholders that are involved in our committees uh, to get alignment and, uh, and win more deals? Uh, it's a topic that um, I'm passionate about. It's uh, it's one of the core value propositions that we help companies uh, uh, understand and solve for here at Nectar. Um, and I speak with uh, sales leaders on the daily uh, to understand sort of their their challenges and their team's challenges around the complexity of buying committees. Um, I am super excited that uh, uh, Mark Casaglo uh, has accepted my invitation and will be my co-host on the, uh, the webinar today. Um, I don't think Mark needs much of an introduction. Uh, he's a uh, a visionary in the uh, sales tech space. He's got street cred uh, from being uh, leading uh, catalyst to the a recent exit, successful exit and growing outreach from what, what Mark, one to 250 uh, in your tenure over there. So Mark, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us today. Let's go. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, so one thing that I think probably a lot of the listeners don't know uh, is that, uh, Mark, I was actually part of your sales organization over Outreach for about uh, two and a half years. And um, I was uh, an enterprise rep on the team. And, you know, Mark, one of the things that that uh, I really um, uh, liked about being part of the team uh, is is one is you were very authentic and and you uh, you don't there's nothing fake about you, man. You just you just sort of what, what you're what you're thinking you say. I'm not um, smart enough also, to. I'm um, not smart enough to populate a fake persona. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing, Mark, is is that you're also very um, uh, pragmatic. So you give great advice, and no matter how busy you always were with like executive level things, if if a rep needed help uh, to you know book a meeting or work on their messaging or uh, we have a deal that was stuck or you know we needed to we needed your help to multi-thread to get to higher level, like you're always willing to help, and so. Mm -hmm. That was the one thing I really appreciated. But the other thing I really appreciated is your ability to tell a story. All right. Mm. So you you tell really good stories about um, uh, you know whether it's you know, tech related. So when you were at outre outreach or uh, you know even before you got into tech and and the ability to tell that story like it almost felt like we were sitting beside you as you were telling it, but it was <laughs> always relevant to like what it is that we were sort of wrestling with, right? Yeah. And so. I'm going to channel my inner Mark Casaglo and tell a personal story. I promise <laughs> it's going to be. I promise it's going to be relevant to uh, to our discussion today. As, um, as long as you don't steal my famous three thousand year old spice merchant story, that's I think where <laughs> I went out on the furthest limb of storytelling. But please, l let me. Let's go. Let's see what you got. <laughs> let's do it. So, so I'm going to take it back to like my senior year of college. Uh, I came home after my first semester, and. Um, you know, I had always worked, uh, you know, to save enough money for, to, to, you know, last me throughout my, you know, my college year, but it was my senior year. Uh, and, um, I was doing a little bit too much celebrating. Right. And I kind of came home that, that winter break, uh, and I ran out of money, right. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to last me a full year. I didn't have, so I had to go back to my dad and say, hey, dad, like, can I get a little bit of a bridge loan here until like I graduate and get a job and I can pay you back. And, um, uh, you know, my dad, rather than sort of give me the money, he said, Randy, uh, I'll give you the money, but what you're going to do is you're going to get up with me every morning uh, and you're going to come into work with me. Okay. And, and my dad was a trader uh, at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And, okay. uh, uh, and so uh, if you are not familiar with the Mercantile Exchange, this was an environment in which you, you know, you, you're, you're by, you, you basically have energy coming into this thing. And I got an education in those four weeks that I would, never gotten before right so my dad's buying committees were much different than what my bidding buying committees are right my dad's buying committees look like this where <laughs> news would hit the market would, 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 would hit the market and you had 10 15 people in your face you know wanting to wanting to trade and so it's very exciting it was very transactional you know you were doing you know tra many trades you know throughout the day okay but it wasn't always like that sometimes news went the other way and sometimes you're, you know, if you were a trader in the market, you were holding a position and nobody's paying attention to you. And that was a tough position to be in. And the reason why I tell the story is I think it's, you know, we can relate to this, right? We can relate to this as sellers when we're trying to uh, generate interest and we're trying to generate, uh, uh, you know, a, a meeting and nobody's getting back to us. Or we've got a deal where we've had some really good activity going on and all of a sudden, like we're getting ghosted or it's, there's, there's no momentum going on. And so oftentimes, you know, we're feeling like a trader right? Who maybe had a bad day 
or had a couple of bad trades. And so, you know, we're thinking like, why did this deal go, go, go off the rails or last minute, you know, I put all this work into the deal and, uh, uh, they went with a competitor because there was a, there was a relationship that with somebody that I didn't know exist. Right. And so what we want to do is today is give you some really pragmatic advice in terms of how do we engage these buying committees, both strategically, you know, thinking about them ahead of the deal, ahead of the meeting, but then, you know, alignment sort of in the deal itself. So let me frame it with one more slide and, and Mark, uh, we'll, I'll ask you a couple questions here. So, you know, I think it's, we, we've all seen the research, right? Whether it's Gartner or Forrester or whoever else talking about like the size of the buying committees and the uh, uh, growing over the, the you know, past couple of years and more people are involved now than they, than, than they were, you know, even one or two years ago. Mm -hmm. Challenger uh, Corporation put out some research um, several years ago and they've updated it uh, last year. I'm actually looking forward to seeing the update uh, this year on um, the correlation between the number of people that are part of a buying committee and uh, your likelihood of winning that deal, right? So it go, the more people that join uh, uh, that buying committee and are part of that decision-making process, the less likely you are to close that deal. Mm. Um, and it gets more complex, right? So as you get, you know, this is, this is, they stopped here at six, but we're seeing buying committees, 10, 12, 15 people, right? Um, now a 30% win rate is probably still pretty good, right? But, but when we start getting more people involved, uh, it gets harder and harder. And I think what that comes down to is um, it's harder to understand like why people want to sort of change the status quo. They, they, it, it's hard for people to, you know, to uh, the, sort of the, the innate um, uh, reaction of people when they hear about a, a project is, why do we need to change, right? And so, um, Mark, you you had uh, said something to me that I actually think you learned from Manny a while ago, which was like, the com a company is really just a political organization that's designed and bent not to spend money, right? Yep. In order for somebody to spend money, uh, somebody's got to use their political capital right uh that they've earned uh and um you know they sort of the overall buck the overall way of sort of, of running that and and i think that kind of speaks to the status quo a little bit the status quo issue so so I, I go to open this up with a question with you mark is why do you think um the the status quo is, is so difficult to overcome at on on deals yeah i think there's been a lot of research on this and actually i think that uh the best book the best sales book of 2023 was jolt effect yeah, I think it put into words a lot of things that sellers that have been professionals for a long time have been thinking. And and honestly, like kind of what it comes down to for status quo is there there's a gravity well that comfort and familiarity create that's difficult to escape from. So like, you know, I've been driving the same Ford Flex since 2016. All right. You know, and People, a lot of people ask me, like, Mark, you like, why do you drive this ugly Ford Flex? Like, you're pretty successful. You should have a nicer car. And I think about to myself a lot, maybe I should go get a new car. Like, maybe I do, like, maybe the Flex is, you know, it looks, I like it, but, you know, whatever. But every time I start looking at a car, like, what I think is, is like, well, am I going to get a good one? Am I going to like it more than I like the Flex? I got to pay for it. And so the gravity well of familiarity and comfort, like keep me grounded in my 2016 Ford Flex with 100,000 miles on it. And so I, I think the same thing happens a lot with, with people is status quo is difficult. Now here's the other uh, side of the coin is once you put your butt on the line to disrupt status quo, you have put yourself inside of a spotlight of accountability. If you don't change the status quo, then it's status quo's fault. And that's very easy to pass the blame. But when you disrupt status quo, whatever happens is your fault. And now you, the fingers can point to you. And that's why status quo is so difficult to overcome for people and get people willing to disrupt, willing to put that political capital on the line is because they can now be pointed at as the problem creator when they're trying to be a problem solver. And as sellers, what we need to do is help people understand that, you know, you're uh, creating or living in the same problem isn't good for the business and ultimately will have negative impact on you versus trying new things and, and innovating and moving forward uh, can have huge, uh, huge benefits. And so th that's what I've, I've seen is just people are uh, hesitant to put their butt on the line and making a decision. Yeah. I, I think, um, 
you know, a, a, a loss of, of, of $10 million is probably easier accepted if uh, it was um, as a result of the status quo, as opposed to somebody who decided to make a decision and then we lost $10 million. So it's, it's, it's safer uh, in a lot of ways. Right. There's it's hard to put blame on institutional processes and tooling and all that that you weren't really responsible for. It's like, you know, if I'm a GM of a sports team and I inherit a team and it becomes the worst team in the league, like it's not my fault. I got only got the players that the team already had. Like I got to go do a bunch of stuff to change it. And so you can do the same thing with uh, technology or, you know, consulting or process processes and all that kind of training, all that kind of stuff is if I don't do anything about it, then I can always point to other people as the problem. Yep. All right. So let, let's put this in a, in a practical situation here. Um, you know, I'm a rep. I call Mark up. Uh, you know, my, my, uh, I, I get a meeting with you. Um, we have a meeting. Maybe, maybe not Mark the CRO. Maybe it's Mark the frontline manager, right? And uh, I get a meeting with you, and we have a, a, a pretty good call. You get pretty excited about it, and you're like, hey, Randy, uh, I, I want to pull in a couple other people uh, because I, I I'm, I'm interested. Um, so let's set up a let's set up a, a demo here and and you know want to hear more about it. Um, what do you think is the trap there? Like 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 or is or is there a trap? Like when we when when we do that, uh, what what should we be doing to help make sure that that second call is a successful call? Yeah. So the first thing is is I read a book and became really good friends with the late Skip Miller who I think is one of the most influential people on sales in the last 20 years. Uh, he wrote a book called Proactive Selling, and it had a concept in there of the power line. And there's people below the power line, BTL. And then there's people above the power line, ATL. BTL people can tell you no, but they can't tell you yes. And they can't take you wide in an organization. They can only take you up in the department they're in. ATL people can say yes, and they can take you wide through other peers in other departments to create and build a buying committee. And so I think that one thing that you have to consider when you're meeting with frontline manager, Mark, is what can frontline manager Mark do and not do? I can't say yes, but I can say no. And I can't take you anywhere else. I can just take you up. And so therefore you need to craft the conversation to accomplish the two things that I can do for you. If you try to have a conversation doing stuff I can't do for you, then you're never going to be successful in it. Versus uh, I'm talking to CRO Mark. CRO Mark doesn't necessarily want to make decisions on products and stuff like that. What he wants is the people that are responsible for the outputs that that product is uh, going to do to make an informed decision and then decide and support that decision is what executive Mark wants to do. So then that's when I take you wide to other places and I introduce you to other people. So it depends on like where you're starting as to how you can execute on a multi-threading strategy. All of BTL frontline manager person can do is keep you inside their department and say, no, maybe they can introduce you to some reps or they can take you down too, but I don't know how much that helps all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, the name of the book is proactive selling and the author is skip Miller. So Mark, let's talk about the, um, so understand that like people uh, at a BTL level can only sort of take you, you know, within there. But what about when others like that they are their teammates, their 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 uh, uh, um, not necessarily their managers, but maybe people in a different department who they work on projects together with? I often hear that like a lot of times when we're bringing in other people to um, to a meeting, like they're coming to that meeting uh, not having the uh, perspective of sort of like the energy and the excitement and what, you know, what Mark, what, what Mark and I talked about in that first meeting. And so they have different priorities, different, different projects. And so I might not necessarily be as interested in what, you know, Mark brought me onto this call for, because I've got other fires that I'm, that I'm fighting right now. Well, l let's what? just get honest, Randy, Randy, like, so if I bring in other people, how much time do you think I used preparing them to help them have a good meeting with the rep that I've already met with? Like how much time do you think I do that and spend doing that? I don't think a lot. The answer is zero. Yeah. None. Yeah. So if you're as a rep, when you're multi-threading and you're expecting the person you talk to, your champion, to spend time prepping people that they're bringing into a meeting so you can, have, as a rep, can have an effective meeting, like you're already off base. Your job as a rep 
is to find the people coming to the meeting and you get them excited to come to the right. meeting so that when you show up, they're not like, you know, Debbie Downer, right? Yep. And so that that's that's the the main thing is we sometimes have this thought that our champion is thinking about what we're doing as much as we are. They're not. They're thinking about what we do maybe 1% as much as we do. Like when they get off the call, they jump into the next call, the next problem, the next email, yep. the next Slack or whatever. They're not thinking about you again until you reach out, interrupt their day again, or they have some blocked thought time to do it, which isn't very common either. So th I think the rep needs to understand like, all right, you know, like for example, I'm, I'm looking at some houses right now. You know how much I'm thinking about buying houses when I'm not out with the realtor? Hardly at all. But when my realtor sends me like, hey, look, look at this. Over the last three years, this, this property is inflated by you know this many percent. That's this much above the market. Like, I think this is a good offer. And then I researched some stuff. And now I'm thinking about it again, right? Because he's getting me into that mindset. And that's what a good rep does. And when you're multi-threading and you're bringing strangers into a conversation that's already started, think about when you're at a party. Like, I'm at a party. And I'm talking, me and Randy are talking and three people come up to kind of join our little circle. And you guys know this super awkward thing that happens. And of course, we're in some event place where it's too fucking loud to actually like hear anybody talking, right? But And then somebody comes up and like gives you the awkward handshake like, hey, and they're trying to join the conversation. That's what happens a lot of times on these multi-threading meetings is like you're bringing in several people into a conversation. It's awkward and weird. The conversation's already started. They have no idea what it's talking about. Right. Imagine if instead of that, you went to all the people that were going to join your conversation and you brought them up to speed, you helped them out and you get made it really simple. Now those people are going to feel more included. They're going to feel more valued. And in the conversation, you're going to get more done. Yeah. So is your, so, um, your advice is be proactive, uh, go out to those other people that are on that meeting, invite, bring them up to speed, get them excited but don't ask for permission. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Like just yeah, you're, you're... No, no, don't ask for permission. God, uh, listen, I, the, the best, one of the best multi threading things I do is what I call the peel off. The peel off is when we have a group meeting, you know, uh, first of all, we, pr you know, prep each in individual person to come to the meeting. But then after the meeting, you peel off each person and you start to run individual deal cycles. So let's say that you have 11.1 people in your buying committee. Guess how many deals I'm running? 11 deals. Right. And I'm going to win all 11 deals to win the one big signature that gets me my one big commission check. Yep. And like that's how people think, oh, well, I'm multi-threaded. I got 11 people in my meeting. And eh. that's called a boring ass meeting where half the people aren't paying attention. What you've yep. really done is you've allowed yourself to now engage in multiple sales cycles inside of a deal and you got to go do more work. And like, again, not to get overly real here, but we're like out of the zero interest rate era, the grow at all costs era. Y'all reps that are listening to this, you have to do twice as much work to make the same amount of money you did two years ago. I hate to be the one to, to break it to you. That's what's going to happen. And if you don't put in, 11 sales cycles with an 11 person buying committee, you won't get paid. And it's pretty much that simple right now. Yep. Um, we, we, right now, um, I think a lot of reps go, will uh, go into that meeting with 11 people and they may have prepped on LinkedIn. They may have gone and kind of get, get, get a feel for them. And, 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 and what we're hearing you say is like, that's not enough. Like we got to be ahead of that meeting, like get them excited again. Um, what about when it's like the, uh, it's not just at the, the wide, it's not just at the peer level. We got somebody at a, at a, uh, you know, maybe their boss, maybe a VP was invited to that meeting. And, you know, we're not sure if the individual fight, uh, uh, project or initiative that got that person excited is a fire that the VP, uh, cares to, to put out, right. They probably have multiple fires going on at any one time. Um, and our job is to find out whether or not the, the fire that we talked about on this initial call resonates with the, the fire that the VP wants to put out. What recommendations do you have uh, uh, to sort of identify which are the most important initiatives uh, in, in, in aligning people around like those fires that need to be put out right now? Yeah. So you, again, who you're talking to dictates the type of information they give you. If you're talking somebody below the power line, what you're going to hear about is user level pains. 
And you know what most executives could care less about? How hard it is for someone to do their job. They don't care. You know, I'm watching these guys out here painting some new houses they're building in my neighborhood. Do you think that the executive of the paint company is wondering, man, Bobby over there is using a three and a half inch angle brush on trim. He should be using a two and a half inch brush. It'd make his job so much easier if he did. Hell no, he's not thinking that. He's just like, paint the damn trim, Bobby. And that's exactly how B2B SaaS executives are. You think that they really care whether you use outreach or sales loft or mix max or whatever the hell it is. They don't care. Your job is just to get the results. Yep. And so if you're a BTL, you're hearing pains that are typically lower grade pains or BTL pains. They're pains that have to do with usability and preference and things like that. The executive is thinking about business level pains. And so if you're hearing now, here's the problem is there's a connection between user level pains and business level outcomes that aren't being achieved what you do. Your job as a salesperson is to connect those two things together. So when I go into a meeting with somebody BTL to get started, I'm going to find out about all those user level pains, but then I'm going to ask them questions about how is that affecting things that execs care about? And I'm going to educate them like, listen, they don't really care like what button you press or what tool you have. What they care about is the outcome. Like, so tell like you told me a bunch of stuff about buttons, which is great. But like, tell me about the outcomes that you're not getting. Then I take those hypotheses and then that's when I present to the, the ATL and mm -hmm. make sure that above the line that I'm getting to the business initiatives, not the pain. And so reps that aren't winning right now sell to three Ps. They sell to pain, they sell to preference, and they sell to project. Pain mm -hmm. is user level. They don't, people don't care about pain. You, people want to buy outcome. Now pain, pain helps you figure out what the outcomes you need to do are, but you can't sell just on pain. Projects are things that people do to achieve business outcomes. If you're trying to sell on a project, it's not big enough. You need to sell multiple things that affect multiple projects because multiple projects are usually re required to get a business outcome. And then preference. Most BTL people will tell you, I don't like to do it this way, or this way doesn't work for me. And nobody's going to spend a hundred thousand dollars because you prefer something over something else. You yeah. have to solve. How do I help the business achieve the outcomes that are mission critical to the business? Absolutely. Um, Got a couple of questions in here. Do you want to take those? Yeah, let, let, let's jump them. Uh, let's jump to them. So um, Jeffrey asked a question about uh, uh, in general, um, or is what we're talking about thus far, does it apply for renewals and expansions or is it mainly net new? Um, there's definitely some uh, intricacies between different motions. Uh, mostly what I'm talking about right now is net new, where you do not have relationships inside the company and you need to do something to achieve those relationships to get a deal done. Renewals, you should have a you should have a relationship. The problem is, is typically your relationship is at a BTL level or the people that are operating the system and not the ATL level. Because again, the ATL level don't want to talk to you anymore because right. they have now considered the problem. I've done my part. I've, I've given the resources. Your job is to make it happen. So you have to figure out mostly uh, how to maintain those executive level connections that you gain during the sales cycle to keep them through renewal and expansion stuff. But uh, that, that's one of the nuances is uh, you have, you ha renewals require typically an executive to say, yes, the executive has been disengaged for months or quarters at a time yep. and bringing them back in is difficult at times when a lot of times the problem still exists. Like very few products come in and completely solve the problem. Yeah. I think um, on the, the expansion, uh, um, uh, uh, point, um, we have to understand just like we did in the sales cycle, not who the buying committee is or, uh, but who's the renewal committee. Um, and who is the, if we're trying to sell more than just seats, the same product, more seats, we're, we're trying to sell a new use case or a, uh, a additional piece of the platform. Like we got to go back to the basics, which is like, why does this matter to the business? What do they care about? How do we get your executive to re-engage with us? Because they've just sort of delegated it down to you as the admin. admin. So I think mm -hmm. it's a, it's the similar principles um, uh, of uh, the pre-sales process. We have to identify, you know, who is it? Who is this? Why does it matter to them? And why should that admin or that person day to day bring that person back in? Or why should we reach back out to them and make it, give them a compelling reason why they should join the next, the next call? Yeah. 
So we got Ramiro here who said, when you meet with a project, you demo them. And, at, and then at the end of the demo, they say something like, hey, I like this, but there are all these things that you uh, that we need to do to implement. Does that mean that they're not interested in um, changing the status quo? I would say that's actually somebody counting the cost of change management. That's to me a buying signal. If somebody comes to me and be like, well, Mark, we want to buy Catalyst. It looks really great, but we have to get our product data right. We have to get this right. That means that they're actually engaged and actively thinking about what they need to do to make this project uh, work. Uh, I can take that information then and be like, oh, you need to do this? Yeah, you do. And there's some parts that you do. There's some parts that we need to do. But like, honestly, like uh, I, I view this exactly the opposite. I think that people that are counting the costs are actually very interested in changing the status quo. They're just starting to realize it's not as easy as just buying something. And that's a conversation I want to have. I'm interested in those conversations. Yeah. And then my favorite uh, London-based AE, Annie Pattinson. Don't tell any of my other London AEs that I also love very much that. But uh, she says, what is the best messaging a, a rep can use to engage you in a deal cycle as, as a CRO? I'll give you the best story I have of a rep getting me engaged in a sales cycle that I wanted nothing to do with. So we were going to buy a, a LMS, a learning management system, uh, at outreach. Um, I was working with the enablement team on it and it was like, listen, I could care less about what LMS you buy. Just don't care. I don't even want to get involved. Just buy it and roll it out. And so people kept trying to get me into meetings, I'm not interested. I, I don't just didn't care. And so, um, I get an email though, uh, from a guy named Chris, who's the seismic rep. And Chris's email said, Mark, I've talked to your four best reps. Riley Devine said he's having trouble with this. Hank Wells told me that he can't do it because of this. Brian Gerard says that he's struggling with this. I'd love to talk to you about why they're so frustrated and how we can help. Well, shit, how am I going to ignore that? Right. And so like, I think like that's one of the keys of like this BTL, ATL thing is, is, is when people are sharing me with me, the struggles my team is having and connecting it to why I can't do this thing, which is what Chris ended up doing. Then I now have evidence and uh, there's something for me to learn. And now I'm interested when there's something for me to learn. Yeah. And so like, that's what I would say is like, th that's the best that it's ever done for me. Now let's say that you can't do that or you don't want to do that. Like what's, the, what's the best messaging? Uh, there's two ways. One is your email to get me into a meeting will not work. You have to get your champion to get me into the meeting. If my head of SDRs calls me and says, I need you for this parallel or power dialer solution because I need your this, this, and this, I do it for them. I do it to help them. And Or you have to find somebody that's a peer of mine that's like, hey, heard that you're selling to this person. Or you're heard you're considering this solution. Like I bought this solution. You want to chat about it? And then that ends up getting me into the deal cycle and getting information, though it's not maybe as direct, but eventually like I'm now in, right? And so don't forget multi-threading isn't just having somebody in a meeting. It's just understanding where their brain is at, where their mind is at and involving them and keeping them in the loop. Don't forget one of my biggest things I say is executives want to be in the, uh, want to be in, in the know, but not in the weeds. Mm -hmm. And so there's a way to get to multi-thread me where I'm never in a meeting, but I am in the know and I value that. And that's meaningful to me is, but I might not want to attend a meeting. Yeah. So how, how does that look? Does that look something like, you know, we have a meeting with a team and we get some valuable insights. We, we, we figure out how that actually, what, why the, why Mark would care. And we, Hey, Mark just had a great meeting with your team. We discussed X, Y, Z. Uh, it seems like it might be uh, impacting your overall objective of, you know, growth. Uh, no action required. Just wanted to let you know, you know, that kind of, you know, we're at something, something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't even know if the, if Chris ended up asking me for a meeting or if I asked him for a meeting after he sent that, I can't remember, but like whatever he, I would have done either one because the, the email was so compelling and it was teaching me things about my own org that I did not know and relating it to a business outcome that I was trying to achieve, but was unable to.
Yeah. And that's when I'm like, okay, this, this, this guy knows my business. And actually when it came down to the last, we it was between high spot and seismic and the way we made the decision, I was like, seismic knows our problem better. I trust them to solve our problem in a continued way better because they took the time. They didn't just show me a bunch of crap in their platform and talk shit on the competitor. Yeah. They actually took the time, like this rep took the time to talk to my four or five best reps and get the information and like that. Okay. They understand what's going on. I think what's key on that one is, uh, and it's sometimes it might be fly in the face of kind of what we're, what we're coached on, which is like, you need to call high. Like you need to get a, you need to get a, a, a big meeting. You wouldn't take that meeting because if, if I were to just reach out to you, I didn't know anything about the organization, but doing a, a, a call with an IC, spending 30 minutes to understand sort of what's going on, project code names, you know, and, it's just, and then leveraging that, that research meeting, if you will, to then you know, with you, I think is, um, often uh uh people say well you're, they're not high enough or why would i want to take that meeting well you take that meeting because you're actually gonna learn a whole lot that's going to help you advance that deal and, and and learn something that that mark is going to care about where you wouldn't know otherwise unless you were talking to somebody kind of at the at the you know at the individual contributor level yeah 100 percent. the the more you know the more power you have there's lots of ways to get information 10ks looking at people's LinkedIn posts, like as a company and being like, oh, they're doing this. This must be a strategy that they're doing. Talking to somebody directly, like a, an executive, talking to somebody that's a individual contributor that understands what the, there's a million ways to get the information. But yeah. when, when it comes to multi-threading though, what you're trying to do is get information to draw other people into the conversation so that you can actually talk to them about how they're perceiving what's going on and connecting it to how your solution creates a, an outcome that they're after. Hmm. Why don't let's change gears a little bit uh, and let's talk about how a rep can leverage their executives to help them uh, multi-thread or advance a deal, right? So, uh, you know, very easy to go on LinkedIn, see that Mark connected to somebody over this organization. Um, uh, a lot of reps will, might come to you and say, hey, Mark, uh, could you know so-and-so over at this company? And, you know, do you mind sending a, an email? They're putting work on you, right, uh, um, to, to do that. How, what When you coach, when, when a rep comes to you and says, hey, Mark, I, I need to, to get higher in this, in this uh, uh, opportunity, and it seems like you've got a connection, what do you ask of them uh, to make, to make that request. Yeah, I, I need a draft. Uh, cause you know, I don't know enough to create a draft on my own, but then I'm going to personalize the draft. But here's the problem is most of the drafts that people send to me are way too long, way too salesy. They don't sound like they're coming from me. They sound like somebody drafted it for me or like a salesperson is trying to get something done. Like I don't in a meeting to somebody I know say, do you want to meet Tuesday at 5 PM or Wednesday at 2 PM? I don't talk that way. Right. So, uh, you know, I think the main thing that I need is w why would they want to meet with me? Like what value do I add, including me in the call with the, the deal you're selling? And that's what I'm looking for from the rep is like, you know, a, more about the deal, you know, me help that me understand why I would be interested in having this meeting with them. And then we use that as a reason why they, they should meet. That's what I found most effective, but yeah, sending and drafting an email for an exec to get somebody in, involved in deal is a, is a, is a very established play and something that you definitely need to be good at. Yeah. Well, and I also think there's a component to it, which is what's the outcome we're trying to drive. Like, like, like don't just have the exec re do the reach out, but like, what do you want them to do? Which is, I think is what you, what you're naturally good at that, but maybe a lot of people just say, you know, Hey, I'll, I'll do the reach out, but, they don't they don't know what we're trying to drive towards and so i think it's important for the rep to to be able to um you know enable their their exec on here's why i want you to reach out uh here's what i'm hoping you're able to do it's maybe it's you know beyond getting a meeting maybe it's just understanding a little bit more about their priorities right uh, but giving your executive like like the, what's the goal of the reach out i think is important as well yeah 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 um all right, let, let's uh, let's do uh, a, a poll. I want to uh, hear from the the audience on uh, some of the the uh, ideas that that they have or or um, uh, concerns that they have. So, uh, Pranay, if you could launch that uh, that first poll for us.
Okay, so what is the biggest challenge that you face uh, uh, when engaging complex buying committees? Identifying the, the right stakeholders with influence, maintaining consistent engagement with them uh, throughout the, the process, uh, garnering consensus among committee members, or matching the right message to the right member at the right time. Let me click the little polls button to bring that up because I was like, where is this popping on my screen? What is it doing? So it looks like about 50% here. Um, sorry. I just uh, I just clicked out of it uh, by mistake. What, what, what's the, uh, what, what are we getting here for results? I clicked out of it by mistake here. 50% of people are saying maintaining consistent engagement with every member of the buying group. 27% are saying matching the right message to the right person. Um, the 17% say identifying the right stakeholders and 4%, which was my answer, garnering consensus among community members. <laughs> I guess I'm out of touch. <laughs> but listen, let's talk about maintaining consistent engagement with every member of the group. So engagement, it, it, let's define engagement to do that. First of all, engagement is two way. Engagement isn't you sending stuff; it's getting stuff back. So if if that's the if that is the um, the definition, then that is definitely a big problem. But you have to remember that a buying committee or a buying group is going to have different levels of engagement with you. If you're expecting a reply back of every email, expecting them to attend every meeting that you ask them to, then your expectations are screwed up. Right? You have to have that champion. Like the the key to multi-threading is your champion. Your champion tells you like what the different people in the buying group need to do. You have your assumptions and hypotheses and need to ask them and, and clarify with your champion and make sure that their instincts are right. But your champion is the key. They're the one that can, they're the one that actually consistently or, uh, maintains the engagement with the group because they're having internal meetings. And so you want to like arm that champion with, Hey, I haven't heard from this VP in like three weeks. Like, how are we doing with them? What's going on? Oh, they're great. They've been on vacation for two weeks and they're totally on board. All right, great. Then, then you're not going to have a consistent engagement with that person. Their, their vote is already cast and yeah. they're not even in the office. Right. So, uh, uh, champion building is the key to multi-threading because they're actually the spool around it, which everything is wound. Right. Yep. And when you don't have that, you just have like a big knot and you're never going to feel like you're consistently engaging with people because you don't have that insider knowledge. And don't forget, there's a huge, one of the biggest um, mistakes I see salespeople make is they confuse coach with champion. A coach is somebody that can give you information, but can't do anything. A champion is somebody that gives you information, but can do things. They, they advocate for you when you're not in the room. They have power and influence over the decision. And they also have a, a personal reason why winning helps them. Right. And so you make sure that you're defining coach and champion correctly because people will have a coach treat them like a champion and then wonder why the buying committee isn't responding or engaged. It's because you don't have a real champion. One of the tests of a champion is their ability to help influence a group of people and be able to get people in meetings that matter, getting responses that matter. So uh, that the, the key to maintaining consistent engagement with people in the buying group is you have to have a great champion. You, you will be unable to do it without a champion. One of the, um, a, a book that I read recently, it's a, it just came out this year. It's fantastic around uh, champion building and champion enablement um, called Selling With. Um, by, by oh, man, Nate. Yeah. The biggest, it, it was, uh, biggest up and comer in sales thought leadership, I think. He's he's. It, on fire. That's my man. Yeah, it it was fantastic. Uh, uh, packed with with you know useful practical advice. Um, so if you haven't read it, uh, I highly recommend go go check it out. Um, one of the things that Nate talks about is um, uh, we have to go. We as sellers have to uh, enable our champions. Um, we can't just rely on them to do things. And and it goes back to something we talked about, Mark, uh, which is how do we engage the executive, right? So like we actually you know when when we would, would reach out to our executive and say I need your help. Um, uh, it's similar with champions. Like you got to give them, you create the email that you want them to send around, create the, uh, uh, co-create it with them um, on terms of like the message that you're trying to communicate, why should people should care heading into a meeting, what problems that we discussed, um, why it's making, you know, might have an impact on, on the business. Like we can't let our champions do that, that work themselves. We've got to be active on that. So uh, highly recommend that book.
Listen, most champions are barely doing their job right. Do you think they're going to run your sales cycle right? You're crazy. Yeah. Let's. Um. So I want to ask you a question about because uh, I think it. Um. Some reps will have a very good meeting and they have the happy ears on and we get the next meeting set up and you know we got the five people we get really excited about it. There's uh when we were when we worked together at, at outreach, um, we had a very structured sales process around stages and how you can move a deal from one stage to the next. And we had a concept called three two one, which yep, is before you can move out before you can move out your deal out of stage one, we had to identify three people from two different departments departments and one of them had to be a, a senior level person, right? Mm -hmm. In ATL, right? And until we have that, uh, we, uh, and that, that, that was the first piece. And the second piece was, do we have a problem, right? That, that, that needs to be solved, right? And you could go three, four meetings until you identify those, those two things, you weren't allowed to pull, pull out of stage one. Yep. So the question is, do you think that reps sometimes aren't as disciplined? Like, like they, they follow sales process of their, of their own, organization right like um but sometimes we get uh, too far ahead of ourselves on i got all this great all these, these meetings and people are engaging and we th think a deal is healthier than it is but we haven't identified that problem yet and it kind of goes back to that status quo issue we have not identified cross-departmental uh uh level of, of of seniority and do we actually have a problem that we could solve so uh, the question is around discipline of the deal to making sure that we're not confusing um, activity, people on a deal with a real deal. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, the, you need to have a problem. The problem has to be big enough to be worth solving. And you have to have somebody that cares about the problem. Like if you don't have those three things, then I don't think, I don't think you can control the deal. Like there's nothing to control. There's nothing to sell. You're just like hoping to either, um, manipulate somebody or like pitch the crap out of them. I just, uh, I don't know why, but I went on the, uh, the sales movie binge last night and watched Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross and boiler room. I don't know what possessed me to do that, <laughs> but like both, if you want to watch horrible, uh, you know, uh, generalizations about salespeople, watch those movies. It's just like, I'm going to talk you into it. I'm going to manipulate you with my language into it. Right. So you have to be super careful, um, about like what you're doing. The way that you don't get into those cheesy ways of selling is you get curious enough to actually uncover a problem, learn about it, discover it with the person, like dig into it. And, and in doing that, like, people legitimize you as a, somebody that is a subject matter expert in that area. And then if you can quantify that challenge in a way that's meaningful to the business and find the person that cares, you work. Now, you know, the person that cares isn't enough to do a deal anymore. You got to get a bunch of people that surround that person to say yes to. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, I think that people assume because they're in a meeting that people want to buy. And I think the other, the, opposite side of that coin is probably a more correct assumption. People are in a meeting, they still don't want to buy. So we got to work really hard to figure out like, why would they want to? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about some of the sales tech that's out there right now in the space that, you know, the, we, you and I both came from outreach, uh, whether it's outreach or sales loft or Clary, you're gone. Everybody's building this, this uh, uh, intelligence layer to help them understand um, you know, how healthy a deal is. Do we have the right people engaged? Um, and, and, uh, uh, you know, certain to it, but, but I think what's fundamentally missing sometimes is understanding, um, engagement over the course of a deal, right? So you'll, you'll see in, in a lot of these applications, they'll have like the circles, the size of the circles. And it's like, well, the circle's really big because we've had this meeting, right? But <laughs> the, the most important person hasn't get, you know, they, they were on the first meeting and they dropped off. They're not, they don't care anymore, right? What do you think some of the, the limitations are right now of the, the tech in terms of trying to identify deal health, um, particularly around like, you know, it's uh, simple, Randy. It's so simple. I, I work directly with data scientists at outreach trying to solve opportunity scoring problems. I worked with engineers. I worked with people like Catalyst over the same stuff. It's super simple. 
the number one problem is no rep on the planet. And I'm going to stress no, as in zero, go in and every single opportunity attach everyone that should be attached to that opportunity. Yep. And the minute that you don't do that means the minute that you're missing information. So what do most companies do? They go to the account level. And so now you got some SDR reaching out to somebody because some auto email went out and it looks like you're contacting the account when you're really not or, or, do, or selling that opportunity when you're really not doing anything. Or you have multiple opportunities inside a big company and everybody's activities all go into the account. And so every, every deal looks healthier than it actually is. The, uh, the number one problem is people don't put the right people into the opportunities which is okay only if you are a super small company that only has one person working an account and yep. every single thing that you do inside that account has to do with that opportunity, which let's just get real. That's very few and uh, far between. Yeah. I would add to that, that even if, even if the, uh, the sales tech out there right now is able to capture um, the buying committee in their thing, but they're not attaching them to the opportunity, that has a downstream effect for every other department that uh, that works off of information uh, in Salesforce, right? So a marketer who's trying to do ABM um, does not know what the engagement looks like on a, on a previous opportunity because reps aren't adding more than one person. Maybe the validation role was there, like you had to add one person before you created the opportunity, but everyone that's come in and off of that deal like doesn't get added. So when we win that deal, marketing can't do better customer marketing. If we lose that deal for whatever reason, uh, we want to go back and and uh, and retarget and remarket. Like marketing can't do that um, if they don't know who was engaged with us in the in, in the buying cycle, right? Um, I also uh, I had a uh, I had a really interesting conversation um, with a uh, uh, head of of, of marketing um, uh, last week, and they had said that right now, if they look at their closed lost opportunities, about forty percent of them are marked closed lost. Uh, because they uh, of um, no decision, okay. Mm -hmm. And and what they had said was a deal that's marked close loss, no decision, isn't necessarily a deal that we can't go back and win in the future, right? It's just that they're just not ready to buy right now. The the sales rep, uh, uh, you know, wasn't able to show them why the cost of inaction is greater than the status quo, and just the the, the deal died on the vine, and so um, what they had said was the pro. You know, so right now they don't treat closed loss, no decision deals any different than the regular closed loss deals. Because if they go back and look at those deals, there's one person on that opportunity. Mm -hmm. But imagine a world in which we've got five or six or seven people that were involved in that, in that uh, uh, buying committee. And now the salesperson has intelligence on what there's, what that particular company's struggles were, what the, the, the individual struggles are, what the pains are. We can then go pass that back over to the marketing team and give them in uh, uh, the, the real pain, real issues that they can though go develop content and, 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 and sort of, you know, people don't like this analogy, pick the scab of that pain to try to reignite that. And so their hypothesis is if I can get those uh, buying committee members as part of the opportunity, it's going to help me uh, develop more pipeline or re reinvigorate previous pipeline because we're going to be able to do better ABM with those particular people. So super, super important um, that, uh, uh, you know, those buying committee members get part of the opportunity. But I think that that is a struggle right now in, in, uh, in a lot of the sales tech that is out there. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Cur curious, uh, Mark, did you, did we treat uh, close lost, uh, no decision opportunities any differently than regular close lost when either outreach or, or when you were at, uh, at catalyst? I don't remember. I don't think so. I think we, yeah. we, kept no decisions. I think a lot of times what ends up happening is the most, most reps only know that they didn't win the deal. They don't have any, they don't have a lot of optics into what eventually happened. Did a competitor, did they decide not to do anything? I think a lot of people don't really uh, do that. And, and some companies are unwilling to even tell you. So, yeah. Let's uh, uh, let's go back to the, the the questions. Unfortunately, I clicked on something and I can't see them right now. So, Mark, if you uh, uh, see any in there, maybe you can. Uh, you yeah, can the, read they asked, somebody asked about the three two one framework. That's uh, three people, two departments, one person's above the line, or, or can be identified as a champion. Uh, that's the that's the three two one concept. It, it just helps you start to get into that multi-threading mindset and asking about buying committee early, so that you're not 
you know, halfway through the deal and realize you haven't talked to two thirds of the people you need to talk to. That's the only other question in there, man. All right. Well, let, let's, um, what, what, uh, did topics did we not talk about Mark that you think, um, as a CRO, uh, when, when, you know, around buying committees, making sure we've got alignment, overcoming the, 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 the uh, the cost of inaction, like what, what advice, other advice might you give that we haven't spoken about today? Yeah, I, I, listen, I, I'll just reiterate that. I think the biggest thing is, is y if you treat everyone like their own individual sales cycle, that means you do discovery for them. You do value uh, conversations with them. You do a demo for them and the people that they support. I think that that's what real modern multi-threading is, is it's, um, it's going beyond the, um, the, Hey, there's a bunch of people in a meeting that know about what's going on versus I'm engaged with a bunch of people and try and actively working to figure out like, how does our solution help them drive their part of the business initiative that's trying to achieve a certain outcome for the business that, that that's like when, when a rep takes the time and does the work and do that, they almost always win the deal. Cause mm -hmm. most reps don't do that. They just are like, Oh, well, yeah, the VP was in the meeting. Well, did they speak? No. Well, were there's a camera on No. All right. Well then guess what? They weren't in the meeting. I don't care what <laughs> yeah. you say. Right. Versus, Hey, all right, that happened. All right. Well, let's peel them off. Let's go to that VP, take two parts of the call, talk, say, Hey, I, you know, was hoping to get your feedback on this. Was thinking about this. Like, can we set up a quick call and talk through it? But that, that stuff is how you should do it or even better get your champion to be like hey randy like uh you know we didn't get to ask you this question would you mind having a call with me and the rep so that we can like talk through a couple things because i was unclear of like what your thoughts were on this and that yeah and so like that the again the champion is the key yeah the other thing i would i would suggest is like uh when you got those people on the call and you know what if you've got a a, a product like a gong or an outreach and you can see like who's all there and who has been asking questions or who's been silent. Like the most deadly thing that can happen on a deal is a person that's on the call who doesn't say a word. Uh, and then they all get off the foot off the call and they regroup and they've got a very strong opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the person that didn't speak anything. So like, like pay attention I, 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 to the people that are on the call, ask them questions. Uh, hey, how did, you know, how might this impact certain of the things that you're working on? Like, like get, get them engaged, I think is really important um, because you know, that, that then there can help us, you know, understand who those detractors might be or where we might have, have uh, uh, similarity around, around uh, point of view. Um, that would be the first piece. And the second uh, piece of advice I would recommend that I've seen work really well is uh, when we have those, those, you know, meetings where people are, are invited and, um, you know, maybe it's people we haven't spoken to before and they don't attend the meeting, right? They skip it. Um, that's a great opportunity to follow up with them individually and say, Hey, sorry, we weren't able to make the meeting. Here's kind of what we discussed. Would you be open to, to a, a quick 15 minute call to understand you know, how this might impact you or, you know, beyond the call recording, you know, take those, uh, uh, take those people that are on the call and single thread with them, right. Yep. To try to understand what their opinion is. I think that's a, a play that we've seen work really well. Yeah. So a couple other questions came in. How important to you, to you as a buyer is a formal business case? Not important at all, James. I, first of all, don't believe your business case. I think it has funny math in it. There's usually an assumption or two that get me to the business outcome I'm after that. I don't understand how you're making those assumptions or whatever. So I could care less about a business case, honestly. Like what, what I'm looking for as a buyer specifically is, do I buy, like, do I get it? Like, oh, with outreach, I see how I can now reach out to a hundred people a day instead of 20 people a day because of X, Y, and Z. Conceptually, this makes sense to me, right? And so that's how um, I don't care about the business case. I don't need to know the ROI, like, and all that kind of stuff. I might have to figure out something like that for my CFO. So I might need the materials to like em empower me to get the, the deal done. But like as a buyer personally, I could give a crap about business case. And I think most people don't. It, it, asking for ROI and business justification and all that is one of those knee jerk things that buyers that don't know what to do ask for. I need a demo. I need ROI. Dude, you're not even going to read it or look at it. That's not even true. You don't need that. Like so those are typically objections that you need to clarify to understand what's really going on. 
And the second thing is, is, is there a strategy you use to get ATL involvement or on, on defining the problem and business outcomes for a business case? If you're at the BTL, OTL levels, OTLs on the line, like you, you, we can't quite figure out if you're ATL or BTL. So, uh, uh, that I used to get ATL involvement. Yeah. So, uh, I like the hypothesis building. All right. So I think that the point of discovery is to create a hypothesis and the hypothesis is where you take what you know about the company, you as a subject matter expert, the resources of your company, like an SC or whatever, and you come together with like a super smart thing. This is what I think is going on. And I think that one way that you can get ATLs involved is you come to them with a hypothesis and ask them to tell you, is this right or not? And what will happen is, is if you're right, they think you're awesome and you know you get a lot of legitimacy. If they think you're wrong, they appreciate the effort. There's probably some smart stuff in there. And then they refine and help you clarify what the hypothesis should actually be. And I think executives respond to that much better than, hey, tell me your top three challenges. Like I could care. I, I hate that question. It's a huge question. I don't know if I trust you. Like, what do you mean? Like, I have a new challenge every single day. What I would prefer is someone coming to me and be like, hey, Mark, despite A, doesn't seem like you can do X. And because you're not doing X, you're not getting this Y thing. And that's as measured by this metric, uh, you know, over here. And that's a problem hypothesis statement construction that we use. Despite A, can't do X, don't get Y as measured by Z. A is the current investments and the current solutions that they've put into the problem already because they've already, if it's a problem, they probably already tried to solve it. Uh, can't do X or the BTL level pains that the users have. Like I can't do this thing, right? That's not what the ATL care about. So if you can't do X, that means you're not getting Y. Y is the ATL things that they're, the outcomes that the business is trying to run. And then uh, as measured by Z, the Z is a metric that shows you the, how, the magnitude of the problem. You know, if the magnitude of the problem is 400K and you sell a million dollar solution, that doesn't make sense, right? So that's uh, that's how I help get ATLs involved is create a hypothesis according to that construct. And I send an email like that'll say something like, hey, I've got an interesting hypothesis I want to share with you and get your reaction on. Like, would it be okay if I shared that with you? And and that's what I do. And then uh, Ramiro asked another question. Have I, I have a question regarding the scenario you brought up with your four best friends. Let's say Chris met with them, but didn't want to be name dropped. How do you bring up those pain points to an executive without singling someone out? If they had just said, hey, one of you, I talked to four of your top sellers. They asked to be anonymous. Uh, seller A said this, seller B said that. It would probably have been not been as effective, but it still would have been effective. And listen, like, I, I tell you what, like, I understand like the whole don't want to name drop. I don't want to do this and all that. But like, you need to t get people over that. Like, do you want your problem solved? Then you got to have some skin in the game, buddy. Like, if I'm going to interview you and find out a bunch of stuff, like, and then I say, oh, generic salesperson A, it's not, it's not as effective as if I say Hank Wells said this. So like, I know Hank Wells. I know what he says. I know who he is. And yes, he would say that. And did I know he would say that? Exactly. No, that's interesting to me. Yeah. Would he complain about something? Yes, Hank Wells. He complains about stuff all the time. That's an inside joke. I hope Hank Wells listens to this, this <laughs> webinar. <laughs> well, listen, we are uh, we are just about at the top of the hour. Um, I just want to thank uh, everyone for joining. Um, hopefully, that we have given you some um, tactical advice and uh, uh, something that you can guys apply to your your day to day. Um, Mark, uh, always love jamming with you. Uh, appreciate the hour, and I look forward to connecting with you again uh, uh, soon. See you, everybody. All right, take care.